name is Josh Leftwich, and it's a, it's a joy to be with you here this morning. Um, I have the privilege of serving as a family ministry pastor here at Eternal, and uh, it's, it's great because we get to create environments every weekend where we hope that every family can experience joy and following Jesus. And if you want to know what kind of family pastor I am, I love when kids run around in church. Um, if that makes you cringe a little bit, I'm sorry, but uh, I believe that our God is a God of joy and, and laughter and life, and so whenever you hear footsteps and it sounds like elephants upstairs, it's, it's little kids playing games and, and opening up their heart to the gospel truth of who God is and who God says that they are. And I have the joy of presenting God's word to you this morning as our senior pastor, Pastor Don, prepares to begin Genesis next week. As Kristen said this morning, we're excited. It's going to be a really um, rich journey for us as a church. We're going to be all in on this journey together, families all together from, from little ones in preschool up through high school, and then what we do in here on Sunday mornings, all aligned together in Genesis this new year. So we're really excited. It's a lot of work, as you can imagine, and so we're excited uh, that Pastor Don has one more week to prepare for that. And, and last weekend, we began what kind of evolved into a two-part um, study uh, on, on the kingdom, on things to come, on, on a newness that is coming. And Scott Cunningham, one of our elders, did a great job of sharing on John chapter 3 in this interaction between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus who had many questions about this Jesus who was stirring so much up in Israel, who was stirring so much up in the religious world, who was stirring so much up in the philosophical world, in the social world, that just changing things, bringing light to old ideas. And, and so we, we saw this conversation unfold and, and this idea that Jesus presents that you need to be born again, born another. Scott taught us a word, born another. And, and this idea that we're born again, we're born from above, there's a newness, there's a a new life awaiting those who call upon the name of Jesus. And, and one of the phrases that really stuck out to me the most last weekend was this in verse five, when Jesus says, unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And I love how Scott led us back to the Old Testament, to Ezekiel, to, to see what it looks like to be washed by the water, cleansed by water, cleansed by the spirit, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And so we, we settled last weekend on this idea that we are saved from ourselves, from our sin, from our situation, not by ourselves. Romans 5.8, we learned that, that while we were dead, God made us alive. And so we are saved from ourselves, not by ourselves. And then secondly, we learned that we are saved from the consequences of sin, from the consequences of ourselves, but we're also saved into something far greater than we could imagine. And so as I sat here last weekend listening to Scott conclude his sermon, I, I knew exactly where I wanted to go this week, which was to discover what are we saved into, not just what we're saved from. We, we understand, most people understand Jesus as a, as a means to, to not go to hell and to one day enter into heaven. But what are we saved into now, today? What are we a part of in this Moment. And so our attention shifts this, this morning to the idea of the kingdom of God. What is it? Whom does it belong to? Where is it? When is it? Why does it even matter? Well, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give us clarity and understanding this morning as we look into God's word. Heavenly Father, your name is great and mighty and above all other names. You are holy, you are loving, you are gracious, and you are wise. And so we, we ask you, Father, this morning, your, your word says that you give wisdom to those who ask. And so we ask, Father, for wisdom by the power of your Holy Spirit here this morning to understand your word so that we may know more about who you are and who you say that we are. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's say that you and I were to sit down at Starbucks this week for a cup of coffee, and after some, some muffled, masked small talk, right? Maybe I turn to you and I say, hey, what is the kingdom of God? 
How would you describe the kingdom to me? What, what can we learn together about the kingdom of God? Per, perhaps one of us would say the kingdom of God is, is heaven. It's where God has set, is sitting, and will sit forever enthroned, surrounded by angels who praise him and sing of his glory all day long. Perhaps the kingdom of God, maybe one of us would say, is creation. It's, it's everything that God made. If he made it, then he is king over it. Therefore, it's his kingdom, regardless of who acknowledges it. Maybe you'd have an entirely different answer or maybe no answer at all. In fact, if you're like me, if I could admit, if I could be transparent, perhaps the kingdom of God is not a reoccurring thought in the moment by moment of our daily routines. Perhaps the kingdom of God, defining it, understanding it, participating in it, is not something that's regularly taking up space in our minds. And so perhaps we need to back up and we need to define and we need to understand what we mean when we use a phrase like the kingdom of God in the first place. When we see the phrase kingdom of God in the gospel, the word used for kingdom is a Greek word, basilia, which means kingdom as a physical location. It also means kingdom as a kingly rule. Digging deeper, Basilia is the realm in which the king sovereignly rules. To simplify even further, we could say a kingdom is a realm in which a ruler rules. And so if you and I were having coffee and, and one of us were describing the kingdom of God, we might answer and say, it's simply the realm where God rules. And while that's true, it's not really enough to help us understand what Jesus meant because he said, when we're born again, we're born into this kingdom. There are more questions to be asked and answered. So we ask for a refill of coffee, and we do the hard work of understanding a complex idea. Jesus spoke often of the kingdom. In Mark's gospel, the first words recorded of Jesus are in chapter 1, verse 15, when Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Luke records Jesus' words in chapter 17, verse 21. He says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Entos is the word he uses there, within you. But then later in Luke's gospel, chapter 19, verse 11, he says the kingdom of God is coming. He teaches a parable that the kingdom of God is coming. It's, it's out there and coming here. So according to Jesus, the kingdom is, is near, it's here, it's somewhere, it's somewhere over there. And if we're still sitting down at this point having coffee, we were both confused. And maybe we would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. And maybe we would be tempted to say, why does it really matter? Why do we need to understand? And simply to that, I would say, because Jesus gave his life for us to enter into this kingdom. And I think that we should be, understand that. If we're to be citizens of his kingdom, then we should understand the kingdom in which we're going to call home. Did you know that immigrants seeking citizenship in the United States have to take a naturalization test? Probably knew that. And on that test, there's a civics portion of the test. You can take a sample test online. I did. I scored an 85. Don't be impressed. I guessed on many of the questions. And it is, isn't it ironic, though, that, that to enter into the U.S. as a citizen, to become a citizen of this nation, you have to study and learn the important details about what makes our nation work. Many of us who are natural-born citizens here would not pass the test or, or would score an 85, guessing. Some of the questions were very specific. What does the president of the United States cabinet do? How many Supreme Court justices are there? How many amendments are there to the Constitution? And, and some of you are smiling because you like learning about some of these things, but the rest of us would score an 85 by guessing. <laughs> many of us don't know the details about the land that we are citizens of physically. There were two sections that I found interesting that they existed on the test and that they were so important on this practice test. The first dealt with the First Amendment and, and wanted a detailed explanation of what freedom of religion means. The second section I thought was interesting was, that was multiple questions devoted to the Revolutionary War hundreds of years ago. Yes, the, the founding of our country, but very pointed questions. If you're British this morning, if you're listening online or you're here this morning, you're British, sorry, this practice test doesn't paint you very well. I mean, it's it's there are ugly words there about the British and that we're free. 
and such an emphasis on freedom. And most of our founding documents that form our nation, that, that put our forms of government into place, have safeguards defending our freedom. Specifically, never again to have a king. Consider the opening line of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Of course, we know at the time it was written, all men were included in the all men portion, but that's for another time. The founding fathers are depend, they're declaring independence. Independence from what? From a king, King George. They never again want to be ruled by a sovereign authority. And so all over in every government building and every federal hall and every courthouse, there are tones of independence and freedom. It's in the DNA of our culture. We cringe at other nations, cultures, people groups who would give absolute authority to one individual. We find the idea to be archaic. And in some instances, even a violation of human rights that would launch our own military to take action against such a system. Because after all, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness can only be had in a democratically elected form of government who answer to the people. We see how well that's working, don't we? That's my point with all this, to stir up political tension. No, of course not. That's not what we do here. We talk about the gospel. But I truly do believe the United States is a special place. It's where I call home, it's where I'm blessed to raise my sons, it's where we do get to experience life and liberty and the opportunity for happiness unlike many other nations and groups around the world. But, but here is something that I also think we need to realize, is that because of the DNA of this nation forms our view on the world, on independence, on liberty, on freedom, it's very difficult for us to understand a, a good concept of absolute sovereign and supreme authority. It's hard for us to receive the idea of a king who has the absolute right to rule, not just over a nation, but over us as individuals without checks and balances. And because of that, as Americans, we need to be cautious on how we approach not only the kingdom of God, but the king who rules it. In 2017, I had the privilege of preaching the Sunday after Christmas, otherwise known as Low Attendance Sunday. I'm, I'm kidding. But for the very few of you great saints who came that Sunday, we talked a lot about the Magi that year. We talked about the wise men, you know, these, these three little guys in our nativity scenes. We talked about the, the background of who they were and what they were in search of. And the Magi, to, just to refresh us, we're sort of this, um, this kind of Mandalorian-esque secret society, not so secret. They were mysterious. There was a lot of unknowns about what they were, but they were present. Kingdoms knew who they were, and, and they were involved in kingdoms. And they, they, they lasted through transitions of power. They were a part of Babylon. They were a part of Assyria. They were a part of Persia. They were a part of Greece. And they were, became known because of their influence, because of their whispers into the king's ear, because of their involvement in training up future rulers. They became nicknamed as king makers. And so we see when they show up in the story of Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, there is a lot of weight to the statement that comes next. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, these kingmakers arrive in Jerusalem. They arrive at the palace. They are brought before the sitting king of Israel. And they say this. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? The kingmakers have come to the palace because that's where future kings are born. That's where future kings sleep. Except there are no future kings here. There have not been princes born to Herod in quite some time. This is an awkward, uncomfortable situation. And after some tension and after some, some research, it's, it's found that there were prophecies surrounding this baby to be born. And so off the wise men go in search of this baby king. A little bit later in chapter 2, we see the entering the house. They saw the child, that is Jesus, with Mary, his mother. And falling to their knees, they 
worshipped him. The kingmakers find a king. And they're so convinced of this baby's kingship that they don't go into advisory mode. They don't go into containment mode. They worship. Because for the Magi, Jesus was not simply an idea or a philosophy or a religion. He was a king. Consider Herod in the story. Herod was a politically proclaimed king under the authority of Rome. He lives in a palace. He has soldiers at his disposal. His power has limits, but he has a lot of authority and reign over Judea. And yet at the arrival of the kingmakers, Herod instantly spins into rage, into jealousy, into insecurity. It leads to the slaughter of hundreds, if not thousands, of baby boys in the region in an effort to destroy the threat to his kingship. Because for Herod, Jesus was not simply an idea or a philosophy or a religion. But even to Herod, even to the mad king of Israel, Jesus had kingly potential. In fact, an idea that kept circulating in my head this week was that Herod had more respect for baby Jesus as a king than most Christians do for our risen Savior, Jesus King. He had more weight, more more intentionality in the kingship of Jesus than most of us do in the way that we live out our faith today. And that stung this week. I didn't like that. That was uncomfortable for me. And so I wanted to share it so you could be uncomfortable too. The enemies of Jesus, the disconnected from Jesus, saw kingly potential. Fast forward to the end of Jesus' life before the cross, we see again kingly potential being recognized. John 18, we see the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, as Scott explained last week, is handing Jesus over to a man named Pontius Pilate. He's the governor of the region. And because the the Jews lacked the authority to put someone to death, they needed Herod. They needed an outsider, a Roman official's involvement. The problem was Pilate didn't really care about religious accusations. He didn't really care about blasphemous charges that this, this Sanhedrin was bringing. But he did care about keeping peace. He needed peace. He needed to maintain control of Jerusalem. And so an idea sparks and gets Pilate's attention, insurrection. I've seen that word float around on Talking Heads this week a little bit, insurrection. And Pilate grabs onto this idea. John chapter 18, we see this conversation take place. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own or have others told you about me? I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate answered. Your own nation, your own chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? See this dance here? Pilate knows there's foul play at hand with with the Sanhedrin. They're they're dancing around each other. There's a word game going on. And finally, Jesus just dives in. My kingdom, he says, is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Ah, you are a king then, Pilate says. You say that I'm a king, Jesus says. See the cat, the mouse, the back and forth. Finally, Jesus says this. I was born for this. And I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate responds, what is truth? What a a hard-dropping statement. What what is truth? And he leaves, and he hands Jesus over. He's he's bold enough to say to the Jews, I I don't find the charges to be true of, of what you're saying. He tries still to maintain peace without shedding Jesus' blood, but ultimately there's a thirst for blood. And so hanging on the cross above Jesus' head, as they did when they charged someone with death, the charges rang out. Here lies Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And while unlikely that Pilate actually saw Jesus as a threat, 
his kingship was enough to use. His kingship was enough to, to fix the situation. The Magi seek Jesus as a king for their own gain, for their own influence, to put themselves back at a seat of power. They've been in a seat of influence through multiple kingdoms, but, but Rome has not received them in. They seek Jesus out, but instead it changes and they worship him rather than manipulating him. Herod recognizes the threat of Jesus' kingship and seeks to destroy him. Pilate recognizes an opportunity in Jesus' kingship and leverages it to maintain peace. But all three have the wrong picture of the king that Jesus is. And so John, the same author who, who recorded what we just read, the conversation we just read, is given a vision toward the end of his ministry. And so we read in Revelation of the vision that John receives of the king that is Jesus. I want to read this to us this morning. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we're going to read through 16. John says, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war with justice. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one except himself knows. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. The Magi, King Herod, Pontius Pilate, had no idea the majesty and the wonder of the king who stood before them. Yet at least they acknowledged some type of kingly potential in the life of Jesus. Yet we stand on this side of the cross in full view of the revelation of God's word with, with a greater understanding of the identity of Jesus than any who have come before us. And we fail to submit to him as king. Why? Like Herod, we would maintain our own authority in our lives. Like Pilate, we would reject truth as it looks at us in the eyes. Like the Magi, we would seek to manipulate Jesus for personal gain. We desire the kingdom. I believe of most people that we desire the kingdom. Every movement, every new nation, every new form of government formed is based on the idea of something better, something greater, a greater world, a greater kingdom. We are designed as people to search out a greater kingdom. The problem we have is the king. Now, if we were still sitting down having coffee together, if we hadn't got up and left by now, we'd need another refill before we move forward. There's tension here. It's a healthy tension, but it's a tension that needs to be resolved because if we have been saved into a kingdom and we have seen a picture of this majestic king, then we need to ask ourselves, why is it that our hearts struggle to submit to him? And so as another refill of coffee comes, we might take out our pen and begin writing down on a napkin the places in our lives where it's most difficult to submit to a king. What would our list look like? I think we would write down a few things. I think we would write down provision, our food, our shelter, what we eat, where we sleep, where we live. Those, those are parts of our lives we, we like to control. Those are parts of our lives we don't need a king over. Those are parts of our lives we want to have sovereignty in. And so we work hard. and We buy nice things. And we live in nice places. And we sleep warm at night. We don't want a king over those areas. What about our relationships, our, our marriage, or, or parenting, or dating, or singleness? We don't want a king in those areas. We, we, we want to control those areas. We like to have sovereignty in those areas. How about our status? We like to be seen as successful. 
Welcome to Fort Mill. We eat at Chick-fil-A, not McDonald's. We shop at Target, not Walmart. We wear Patagonia. Those are great. I like Chick-fil-A. I like Target. I have a Patagonia hat. Fun story, it, it was left over from a youth retreat. A brand new Patagonia hat. Posted on social media for weeks about it. Is this anybody's hat? It's mine now. If it's yours, you can have it back. But <laughs> it's been worn for a year, so you may not want it. There's nothing wrong with those things. But that's who we are as a people. I mean, we could acknowledge that. We enjoy our status, and we, we want sovereignty of our status. We like to know that we have made ourselves. We are who we are because we worked hard for it, because we made the right decisions, because we, we, we worked for it. Our health, depending on where you fall in all of this, you've taken a lot of action, either to be blatantly open against COVID-19 or to be objectively close to it and protecting yourselves and whether that's a mask or staying home or being cautious grocery shopping or having groceries delivered there's nothing wrong with either side of those things but it's definitely a way we grip on and we want sovereignty over our health we want sovereignty over this this event happening around the world and of course our security as we've seen this week our freedom our sense of independence those are things we want to be sovereign over and the list could go on, but this feels comprehensive enough for our time this morning. So say we're looking at our napkin list and we begin to discuss these areas that are so difficult to submit to for some reason. And what do these things have in common? What does our unwillingness to submit to our king and our provisions and our relationships and our status and our health and our security, what do these have in common? I want to suggest something this morning that it may take a few minutes to connect the dots, but, but hang with me this morning. Because I would suggest that what all of these things have in common, and things not listed on our napkin, but we could certainly add to, is a sense of anxiety. Now maybe you're here and you think, I'm not, I'm not an anxious person. I don't deal with anxiety. Maybe you're here and you deal with chronic anxiety. And I mean, don't, no disrespect to either person. Not a doctor, not a counselor, would not claim to be. People come to me for, for counseling and I send them to a counselor. I'm a pastor. I love God's word, I love exhorting God's word. And so I, I would not at all um, propose to step on any type of medical or counseling advice you've received this morning. But in my Bible, the, the header of the section we're going to read in a moment says, The Cure for Anxiety. And that feels like an arrogant title. I was nervous to put that out. My, my wife, who is way more wise than I am, said I would not put that title out, but it had already gone to print. Um, <laughs> I feel nervous to place that out. And, and so again, I would, I would just qualify the rest of this with saying there are godly men and women who God is gifted in counsel, who understand the mind and understand the world in a different way than I do. And I would not object to their, their pastoring in your life either. With that being said, I think anxiety, though it's becoming more commonly discussed, is still, uh, there's still a stigma attached to it. It still feels taboo to talk about. There's a sense of weakness attached to anxiety, especially for men. There's something about this that feels less than what we're supposed to be. The medical definition for anxiety is an abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear, often marked by physical signs such as tension, sweating, increased pulse rate. By doubt concerning the reality and nature of the threat and by self-doubt about one's ability to cope with it. That's a lot of words. I think it means that we're afraid of what might happen and afraid of how we would handle it if it did happen. It's double, it's double, double fear. If that sounds too clinical for you, consider this explanation by one of my favorite communicators, Bible communicators, Pastor Alistair Begg. He summed it up like this. He said, anxiety is rooted in trying to care by myself for that which only God can do. Worry reigns in our lives when we think or act as if something is ultimately up to me rather than up to God. It actually has to do with the desire to control things. 
And if you couldn't find yourself in the clinical definition, I think all of us have to find ourselves in this exhortation this morning that our anxiety is rooted in our genuine belief that we need to control the outcome. We're worried that the king may not be as faithful as he said he would be. So let me give you some examples of how this plays out. Does God really care about my physical provision? Or is he just concerned about my spiritual life? Does God really care about my marriage, my parenting, my singleness, my friendships? Or is he just concerned about my relationship with him? Does God really care about my status, my success, my reputation? His word talks a lot more about humility than it does success. So where does that leave me? Does God really care or not whether I get COVID-19? Or is he just concerned with my spiritual health? Does God really care about my security, about our nation, about our freedoms? Or does it all end at turn the other cheek? And if that phrase... Does God really, does, if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because it's the oldest trick in the book that our enemy has to lead us away from the heart of God, to lead us away from the truth of who God is and who he says that we are. All the way back to the garden, did God really say? Does God really care? Did God really mean? Think about the interaction. I mean, this is all through us. It's one of the only tricks he has. Jesus is baptized. A voice from heaven comes out. This is my son. Goes into the wilderness. Satan comes out. If you really are God's son. You see the back and forth there. And it all attacks who God is and who God says that we are. And because we are all, I believe, given to a little bit of anxiety, given to a frame of mind that actually believes the things about our lives are dependent on us and our ability to control, our ability to, to control the outcome of events and how we would respond to it, we're quick to take this question from the enemy and let it root so deep into our hearts that even though we're citizens of the kingdom of God who reigns above all, whose name is faithful and true, we struggle to believe that he will be faithful and true in our lives. We don't have a kingdom problem. We certainly don't have a king problem. We have a submission problem. And whether it's our context as Americans or our basic human instinct to desire the, to, to control the outcome, we struggle to submit to Jesus as king. A deity, sure. A savior, absolutely. A friend, of course. But when it comes to submitting the intimate details of our lives to Jesus as a sovereign king who rules with an iron rod, who wields a sword, who has flaming eyes, I mean, there is power in the kingship of Jesus. We pump the brakes because we still want control here. So my hope for us together this morning is that we would find one small path forward, one step forward today, one simple step we could take today to become better citizens of the kingdom. Not to, to be better loved by God, certainly not to earn more of God's love. There is nothing you could do to make God love you. While we were dead, Christ died for us and made us alive. There's nothing you could do to make God love you less. This is not about earning God's favor or manipulating his blessings. It's about living in the truth, we'll say it again, of who he is and who he says that we are. So let's find a path forward together. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 25. As we turn, I'll provide a little context for what we are going to read together. This is from a larger collection of scriptures called the Sermon on the Mount. Pastor Don and a few others taught a great series on the Sermon on the Mount back in 2018. I think it was the summer of 2018. And you could go on our church website, eternalchurch.net, and go to sermons and look for it. And maybe that's a great way to deep dive into this this week as we explore being better citizens of the kingdom. Because Jesus, in this collection of scriptures, is the king talking about what his kingdom looks like 
lived out among kingdom subjects. And so the portion of scripture I'd like to read this morning comes about halfway through the king's sermon on his kingdom. And so if you were able, whether you're at home or you're here in the room, would you stand with me out of respect and authority for the reading of God's word? Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen? can be seated. Thank you for standing. It's not intentional, but you may have noticed the majority of the times I'm invited to preach on a Sunday morning, we we stand later for the reading of God's Word. I don't know why. It's not, I don't map it out that way, but it's nice to stretch our legs a little bit, get up, mix things up. And so imagine we're sitting back down again for coffee. We get our final refill. You've probably noticed in our analogy this morning, I drink Way too much coffee. You've probably stopped long before this moment, but I'm still ordering more refills with my gold Starbucks card. Four mil. So what are our observations about this passage? What's our our renewed view of King Jesus? In Matthew chapter 6, what we just read, speaking of his kingdom, Jesus tells us, don't worry about your life. The Greek word here for worry is merimnao, something like that. Elder Bob Hay can check me on the the pronunciation there. Merimnao, we'll go with that. You say it fast, nobody knows. What does it mean? You guessed it. Don't be anxious. Troubled with cares. Jesus looks into the, the potential subjects of his kingdom and says, you want to know what the kingdom is like? It's a kingdom where its citizens are not troubled with cares. If you ever dealt with anxiety or dealt with someone who's who's suffering with chronic anxiety, then you would know that telling someone who's anxious to not be anxious does not work. It makes things worse. You become anxious about being anxious. Jesus doesn't stop it. Don't be anxious. He gives us the reason why. As I said in in my Bible, the the header for that passage we just read, the cure for anxiety. It's where we derive the title of our message this morning. And it's it's not Jesus' title. Jesus didn't stop and say, okay, time out. We've talked about salt and light. We've talked about, you know, all these other things. Cure for anxiety. He doesn't do that. This is from men and women who have studied the Bible and and summarized this portion of the text. But but there is life here that I think can parallel clinical cures for anxiety and it can give us life for whether we have just a little bit of care and and worry or, or we suffer from this on a huge scale. Jesus says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? The first thought Jesus shares concerning our worries over physical provision is a perspective. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
There are many ways you could interpret this statement, but the simplest for our time left this morning would be to say that our life is both bigger than the temporary concerns and therefore worthy of provision. Our life, our our individual lives, our lives as family, our lives as a community, they're bigger than what we wear. It's bigger than what we eat. It's bigger than where we live. And yet, it is worthy of God's provision as well. What do I mean? We continue on. Jesus says, consider the birds of the sky. Time out. Imagine, let me just derail for a minute. Imagine someone invites you to come hear about this guy, Jesus. He's revolutionary, stirring things up. Government's upset with him. Church is upset with him. It's going to change everything. Maybe like me, there's a little bit of rebellion in your heart, a little bit of rebellious tendency, and you go, rule breaker, I'm in. And you go. And, and, and what do you, the, the banner out front, hear about the new kingdom, I'm in. Ready to hear about this new kingdom. And Jesus says, consider the birds, I'm out. <laughs> but that's what he says. Consider the birds of the sky. What do we consider about them? Simple, really. Birds live with minimal care and preparation, yet our Heavenly Father provides for their daily needs. Notice Jesus says, your Heavenly Father, because there's an identity of who God is that leads us to who we are. Your Heavenly Father provides for their every need. He's intentional to make a connection between the same source of provision, both of the birds and of believers. Because then he really drives the nail in with a rhetorical question. Aren't you worthy more than they? Aren't you more worthy of God's provision than birds? Now in a reformed church like this, we would say, I'm worthy of nothing. But Jesus would say, no, because of who God is, let's talk about who you are. Are you not worth more than the birds? There's a worthiness connection. The same source who created the universe, who breathed stars into the sky, who told oceans how far they could come up on the seashore. The same God who did all of these things provides for the birds. And don't you think you're more valuable than a bird? Do you? And what is your worrying going to do anyway? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? This makes me appreciate my father-in-law. My father-in-law attends our church virtually. Wave to him in the camera. Um, and, and one of the things he, he taught me when I first started coming around, my wife's family and, and dating her and being engaged to her and now married, this conversation continues about what are the, the stressors in, in our lives that we have no control over? And if we have no control over them, then why stress over them? And it seems simple, but it's profound. And he's continued to challenge me with, there's things I can't control, so why stress over it? There's, there's things about our church, there's things about our students, there's things about my family, certainly things about our nation, our world, that I have no control over. So what am I doing by worrying about it? There's nothing my stress is gonna do to help the situation, I might as well let it go. And that's what Jesus is saying here this morning. Can any of us add one second to our lives by worrying? Of course not. In fact, we know because of medical knowledge now that worry and stress places such a burden on our hearts and our minds, it's likely to have the opposite effect. It's likely to reduce the moments of our life. And why do you worry about clothes? Jesus continues. Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. Again, you're you're here to hear about a kingdom Consider the birds, observe the wildflowers. What is he saying? Observe how the wildflowers grow. This isn't kingly speech, but it's what the king says. Wildflowers are dressed beautifully by the creator, some of which are so temporary. Think about this. There are fields of wildflowers that have never been and will never be seen by human eyes. And yet they are adorned more richly than the richest king who has ever existed, Solomon. Jesus makes the connection for us that there are things so insignificant that have more intentionality than we could possibly imagine. 
And so again, the question is posed that if God who shows so much care and attention to a wildflower that will perhaps never be, even be appreciated, it's entirely temporal, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow, then how much more would he show care for us who are eternal, who have no end? Instead, Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. The Gentiles, that, that word simply means outsider. For our context today, it means those who are outside of this. And so what Jesus is saying is that there are people outside of the kingdom and there are people inside of the kingdom who are both hungry. The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And so there's two things for us to consider. One, the outside world is seeking the same things we are. Food, drink, clothing, provision. If we go back to our napkin list, I think we can apply it here. Provision, relationships, status, health, security. Everyone wants these things. There's nothing special about my need for food. I'm already hungry for lunch. You are too. We'll end quickly. There's nothing special about my desire to be a great dad. If you're a dad in the room, I believe it's true that you want to be a better dad. Even if you're not, even if you feel isolated from, even if you haven't seen your kids in decades, there's a desire to be a better dad. There's a desire to be a better parent, to be a better spouse, to be better at being single, to be content, to be a better friend. The desire is there inside the kingdom, outside of the kingdom. There is no difference about the physical and emotional needs of the believer versus the unbeliever. In fact, Jesus says that our heavenly Father knows the things that we need. I don't believe Jesus is calling us to an extremist view of going without. Some have interpreted it that way. It started many movements of, of going without all, all luxuries, all, all things, all purpose. Jesus instead elevates these needs. He says they are so important that they have grasped the attention of the Almighty. But here comes the foundational difference between outsider and insider of the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be provided for you. You see the difference? Everyone hungers, everyone thirsts, everyone desires to be clothed, to be provided for. Bring our list back up. Every, everybody desires provision and, and relationship and status and health and security. But those who have been saved into the kingdom, born again, born from above, who have been made alive, who were once dead, those who have been ushered into the kingdom of God, now have an opportunity to lay aside our anxiety, our deep-rooted belief that these things are dependent on ourselves and believe that the same king who sustains the birds, who clothes the flowers, the same king, lean into this, the same king who found more value in leaving his heavenly throne to be born a human, to live a life of poverty and humility, to humble himself to the point of death on a cross like a common criminal, that same king. Why would he do that? For the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despised its shame. And what was the joy set before this king? What did God the Father place such a value upon that he was willing to exchange the life of his son? It was you. It was me. It was those of us who would call upon the name of Jesus as king. That is our king. And one day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is king to the glory of God the Father. Friends, one day our king will return. We read the promised revelation this morning. He will ride out as a mighty warrior, his eyes like fire, many crowns upon his head. His name is faithful and true, and the word of God, he comes to rule with an iron rod because his rule is perfect, and no one will challenge him, and no one will reject his authority. 
There will be no checks and balances because there's nothing to check. There's nothing to balance. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And every knee will bow in, in acknowledgement. But we don't have to wait for one day to acknowledge him. Today can be the day when the kingdom so comes alive in our hearts and our lives. Today can be the day where we submit to this king and worry no more about the things that we never had control of in the first place. Today can be the day we turn off the news and open our Bibles and stop getting our theology from Twitter and Instagram. We're broken kingdom citizens right now because we are studying the kingdoms of man and not the kingdoms of God. And that is why we are anxious. That is why students' mental health are falling apart. That's why we are posting on Facebook, unfriend me if you don't agree with me. Where's your verse for that? You don't have one, you have a tweet. Turn it off. Open your Bible. Submit to the king. Because these things will follow, not come first. Jesus said the kingdom is near. For some today, you've been in investigating Jesus. You've been investigating the things he said. You've been investigating the people who followed him. You're not sure yet about his kingdom. He said the kingdom is near. Today the kingdom could be near for you. Maybe you have not yet received his grace, his mercy in your lives, but the kingdom is near. Today could be the day you acknowledge your deficiency. Join the club. T-shirts are on order. And cling to his ability to save you, not just from yourself, not just from your sins, but into a kingdom that now becomes entos among you within you. Jesus said, for others, the kingdom is here. It's among you. It's in you. My prayer for us would be that today serves as a reminder we're no longer bound to the concerns of this world, to the results of an election, to the opinions of our neighbors. We're not bound to these things anymore because we have been brought into a new kingdom that is here. It's entos. It's within you. We have a heavenly father who knows our needs and provides for them as we seek his kingdom and we seek his righteousness. For aren't you worth more than a bird? Aren't you worth more than a flower? You are worth infinitely more. And because you have been saved by the blood of Jesus, washed by the water of his spirit, because you have entered into the kingdom of God, how much more, in the words of Apostle Paul, how much more will he not also graciously give us all things? So let us seek the kingdom. Let us submit to his righteousness. And let us trust in the completed work of our king. Let's pray. Jesus, you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done here in this, in this failing kingdom of, of earth as it is in heaven. You taught us to trust in you to provide our daily bread, our provision, what we need, our shelter. You taught us to trust in you to change our hearts into forgiving hearts so that we would forgive as we have been forgiven. You taught us to pray to trust in you to be led away from temptation, to resist the power of the enemy, to, to say no more 
to the question of your identity of who you are and who you say that we are. Because ultimately, Jesus, this is your kingdom. This is your earth. And the outcome belongs to you as it always has. So seal this in our hearts and press upon us as kingdom citizens to be willing to be ruled by the king of the kingdom. Lead us away from the knowledge of this world. Lead us away from the opinions of outsiders. Lead us away from the evil that still lingers in our heart to reject people different than us. And lead us back to seek your kingdom and your righteousness. Because we believe, God, that we are not, we're not seeking your love. We're not seeking your affirmation in our lives. We're not seeking your blessings. We believe the blessing is more of you. So reveal more of yourself to us as we worship, as we sing, Father, whether we stand or sit, whether we cry or we sing out in praise. Lead us to more of you because then whatever follows, we can call blessed.